Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna run through Twitter, see what people are talking about on social media. Uh, we're gonna talk about wealth building, commodity building, um, well, wealth building, commodity or financial related topics. Uh, I'm gonna interject my financial opinions as we go, and let's dive right in. If you wanna follow me, it's at Finding Score Finance, uh, or you can join our community at finding-value.com. Uh, discounts, coupon code if you'd like to join, if you're interested in single uh, companies or sectors. <clears throat> Mineral Stock Investor says, over the past six years, we've observed significant shifts in the valuation enterprise value to pounds per resource of prominent uranium companies. I've grouped selected companies into three clusters, and here are the key findings. Some stocks are strongly undervalued. So here they are. This is group A, B, and C. Uh, in group A, you can see that we've got a large move higher in the enterprise value to pounds resource. You can see these things really moved up. Uh, that's Camco Energy Fuels, Boss Energy, and UR Energy. Uh, group B is UEC, NextGen, Denison, and Global Atomic. You can see the valuations of their enterprise value. So the enterprise value is their market cap. Market cap of the company divided by how many millions of pounds resources they've got. And this is the valuations that he is getting. Uh, group C is Goviax, Deep Yellow, Bannerman, and Fission. Uh, these are enterprise value per pound, and they are mainly in African uh, countries outside of Fission. Fission's in Canada. If you notice, there are has been a large move in the valuations of enterprise per resource of Group A. Group B, a little, a little bit less so in Group C, there's actually pretty cheap valuations in relationship to uh, the resources that they have. Now, some people will say, well, one's got a better resource, one's got mines, um, and so forth. That is correct. Uh, these guys over here are closer to production. For the most part, they might be in better jurisdictions. Uh, at least the, the opinions that people have, the market's opinions on that they're better jurisdictions. Uh, then we've got Group B, which is valued. You can see how the valuation has moved over time. And then you've got Group C, where the valuations have remained depressed. The valuations that we're looking at, some people will say, well, it's automatically better to buy what's cheap. Um, that might be the case uh, this time around. And what we're, what we're speculating on here is which valuations are going to move the most. So we're in 2023, which of these valuations are gonna move the most to the upside? Uh, that is really the question that we're trying to figure out. Uh, in my opinion, uh, if you can handle risk, Global Atomic is mispriced, in my opinion, here. Uh, off the pullback and the coup and all that stuff, <clears throat> uh, that's very cheap for a company that is real close to production. Is the geopolitical risk worth it? That is something that you're going to have to answer. And, and that's, that's what you're going to have to figure out. Uh, last bull market, some of these in the Africa side went up the most because you bought it at what is going to be a very cheap price today and you're speculating on that enterprise value to resource to be revalued upward. There's also other companies that are still expanding their pounds per resource. So <clears throat> you have companies that have pounds per resource in a, in a developer and or an explorer, one that does both. Your valuation comes from the growing of the resources, the pounds of resources. That is where your valuation grows. Uh, so you can have a low enterprise value, but if you grow your resources, that can drastically move your enterprise value way up. The other way that your enterprise value moves up is through the price of the commodity itself. So a lot of these that are more near-term producers, one, they demand higher premiums, higher dollars per pound of resource. As developers move closer to a mine, as they're actually building the mine, you can see a, 
uh, enterprise value to pound resource go up. So they'll, they'll move these groups uh, to the left side to group A. What we want is we want to find whichever company is going to increase its market value against its pounds resources the most, uh, or a company that's going to increase its pound resources and increase its enterprise value against it. Uh, that would be the ultimate. So the ultimate of all of these, if you could do it, is you take one, like an African company that is very cheap, that then goes in and develops it into a producing mine that gets revalued to a much higher level. At the same time, they're expanding their pounds resources. There are a few companies, in my opinion, uh, that might be able to do that. <clears throat> and I'll share that with uh, the members on the website there. And you know which companies, we're already in them. If if you are wondering and you're a member, we're already in it, don't worry. But we'll, I'll share that. But that's what you're you're looking at. You're, you're hoping that you can get in the companies that are cheap and that they get revalued uh, as a producer over these next few years. Coming on down, it says, it appears that Cuppy's Project Zimbabwe is well on its way to becoming reality. Uh, one month later, it says the total U.S. debt is now $33.7 trillion, up $58 billion in one day and up $604 billion in one month, up $20 billion every day, up $833 million every hour. At this rate, U.S. debt will be $41 trillion in one year. Project Zimbabwe is engaged. <laughs> Look at that debt really start to climb there. We've got everyone loves round numbers. 8% for the first time since 2000 is the U.S. home mortgage 30-year fixed national average. 8%. And I know people are going to say, um, oh, it's going to crash the market. It's going to do whatever. We are still short uh, homes. So the housing market's been resilient, but I agree affordability is pretty rough at the moment. Uh, China has cut its holdings in U.S. Treasuries to $805 billion, the lowest level since 2009. Beijing has been selling $502 billion in Treasuries in the past decade, and pace of Chinese selling has been accelerated recently. They're getting and dumping their U.S. Treasury holdings, uh, China. So uh, this is adding to the interest rate fire that continues to go up. Uh, China's dumping. There's other people that are dumping bonds. The Federal Reserve doesn't want to buy them. They're dumping bonds off there. You know, they're doing quantitative tightening. Nobody wants bonds, and that's why interest rates are rocketing to the upside. Uh, Happy Wyan says, if you get too much asset price deflation, then tax revenues fall further. Unemployment rises, and deficits just grow even larger, thus leading to even more treasury issuance and a debt death spiral. It's either Great Depression financial meltdown or the Fed monetizes the debt. It says the collective bond market freakout is funny to watch, especially on here. Daily real-time takes on a market that moves in large multi-year cycles. It says the Fed hasn't broken anything. Asset prices need to deflate. And that's the problem with deflation. You can't deflate prices, guys. You're going to lose your tax revenues, which is then going to further the debt death spiral. They're in a, a problem. <laughs> They're gonna have to handle outcomes here. Um, we talked about the real estate cycle. Check this one out. White House announces new actions on home ownership. Some people have talked about these expansionary phases, interest rates go up, <clears throat> and then governments try to help people uh, to buy homes. They, they put these affordability things in, uh, but they're taking action. You can hit click on the link here. White House announced with new actions on home ownership. For millions of American homeowners, it is a foundation for so many parts of their lives. And they go in about how they're trying to help homeowners um, buy homes and stuff. So that is something that's a little bit interesting. Uh, this has been one of the most aggressive tightening cycles in U.S. history. High interest rates have caused the 30-year U.S. fixed mortgage rate to hit 8%. As a result of higher mortgage costs, homeowners looking to refinance their mortgages have plummeted. Uh, yeah, no doubt. 
Uh, hear me out. The Fed is done and may actually have to cut rates sooner than anybody expects. Here's why. The U.S. government tore a debt spree $600 billion plus in just the past month alone has exacerbated the move in yields due to supply, demand, and balances. As inflation has been coming down, this is now overtly risking in an effectively over-tightening in a market condition even if the Fed no longer raises rates. Several Fed speakers have already indicated that rising yields are doing the job for them, but the velocity of the move in yields has become so historically extreme over tightening may be the end result here. So they may need to do uh, QE to hold the interest rates down. <laughs> uh, hopefully it doesn't get out of control to the upside. Uh, Adam says, for the first time this century, cash pays a higher yield in interest than the S&P 500 does in earnings. We can see that crossing here just recently. That is crazy. Uh, that also means that we're probably going to see the S&P 500 go down in stock price and their yields will go up as their prices go down. Uh, did the oil embargo of 1973 increase oil prices by fourfold? No explanation below. Um, yeah, except in 1973, I think that's when the housing market turned over. But uh, all oil, for the most part, just goes up because of credit expansion. That's really what it is. Uh, oil, uranium, and all these other ones. It's not even supply demand. It has everything to do with credit expansion, which is your demand. Uh, and the asset rotation, as inflation goes up, people sell bonds, they sell stocks, and that money rotates into something else. That is the driver of the commodity booms. It's not supply demand at 100%. It is the investment demand that needs to move away from financial assets uh, towards real assets. Uh, ASX uranium stocks, they were up, but they were up today in America trading. Uh, I've never seen a move like this in the 10-year bond. This chart puts it into perspective. Straight vertical. The bond market looks broken. Too many bonds to sell, not enough buyers. When do interest rates stop rising? Uh, Grady says, the commodities bull market will be the greatest opportunity in your lifetime to get out of the rat race. Every parameter I can think of is in place for the greatest bull of all time. End of rainbow stuff. Maximize income, minimize consumption, and play it the right way. Uh, I agree. And that's why I am focused on commodities and precious metals. Uh, Tavi says, meanwhile, total operating oil rigs contracted again, reaching new lows for this cycle. This marks the ninth consecutive month of declines. ESG policies continue to add pressure to these companies while oil prices are nearing $90 per barrel. Keep in mind that strategic petroleum reserves are at 40-year lows as we simultaneously experience two, two wars unfolding. U.S. operating oil rigs are down. Um, so the best time to buy the rigs is when they start to basically come down like this and then come back up, where they start putting into operation more and more rigs. Massive pullback in 2020 here. And that would have, that was a really good time to be buying um, basically oil, gas, exploration, production, and energy service. Troubling signs at the U.S. Treasury, total public debt rising much faster than annual deficits. Gosh, the more I dig into things, the bigger the problem I find. Today, I will describe the U.S. Treasury black hole. Uh, the debt ceiling and then the debt ceiling raised, and you can see this thing just ripping higher. New fiscal budget as it just goes massively higher. Uh, unchecked spending going on. Peter says, energy equities remain undervalued and are not properly factoring the likelihood of sustained high oil prices. There is no silver bullet to lower prices short term, and the lack of planned SPR barrels will undercut the impact of refinery maintenance. Oil is the trade. Uh, that is what a lot of people uh, are thinking right now is oil. Oil, oil, oil. Why? Because there's no supply response. That's what he's talking about, the, the planned SPR barrels and all this other stuff. No supply response. And they're printing money uncontrollably. <laughs> um, that money, when it's printed, puts oil into a shortage. And oil, again, is the master commodity. It's the number one commodity. And that's where the price is going to get hit first. We're going to see a secondary inflation wave 
uh, that is going to come from this. Uh, Tavi says, this chart puts it into perspective with yields back to historical average equity market valuations are in la-la land. This is the NASDAQ versus the treasuries. I reposted this. Someone asked me, oh, well, the price to earnings ratio is not that bad compared to the peak of the tech bubble. What they're not taking into account is the yields that prices the assets. We are in la-la land, guys. I completely agree with Tavi. When you take into account yields, when you do net present value calculations <clears throat> based off of the new yield that we've got today, we have never been this expensive in the NASDAQ and S&P 500 ever. Ever. We even have cash paying higher than the dividend yield of the S&P 500. And that hasn't happened for a very long time. So get ready. Get ready. We could see a, a big revaluation in the NASDAQ and S&P 500. Um, equity risk premiums. This is the same thing taking yields into account versus the, the pricing here. So this is the Hustman Strategic Advisors. Uh, figure since 1950 based on non-financial market capitalizations, non-financial gross value added, including estimated foreign revenues, figures prior to 1950 based off the Hussman margin adjusted PE. So what they did is they took the equity premium estimate over the 10-year treasury yield. We, given the, where the 10-year treasury yield is, uh, and based off of the price to earnings ratios of where we are, the expected forward returns is minus 6.5% from where we are today. <clears throat> so this is the estimated 10-year S&P 500 total return in excess of Treasury bonds, minus 6.5. We're right down here at what is considered to be one of the worst priced markets of all time in this general location over here all-time worst valuations for the S&P 500, and we've got it today, given where the, where the treasury bonds are being priced today, their yields. And you think yields, if they continue to go up, we're going to move to the left even further if yields continue to go up and the S&P 500 stays where it's at. Shark Tank star Barbara Corcoran insists now is the very best time to buy a house despite interest rates hitting a 23-year high. That's interesting. <clears throat> uh, gold is up 34 bucks, but, but gold mining stocks are barely positive. Investors still don't believe the gold rally is real. They're in for quite a shock. Not only is it likely real, but it will be spectacular. <clears throat> We've got... Every day that ends with Y has TLT red. If only there was a free blog that had predicted such a thing when TLT was still triple digits. <laughs> He's joking because that's what he did. Um, while you're all watching the bombings in the Middle East, I continue to bomb TLT. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, what is this? <clears throat> what is this? So I posted this up. I said, what is this? Um, what that actually is, is my account value um, of one of my accounts. Uh, so it consolidated and now it's breaking up and that's the account value uh, of one of my accounts that I own. I just posted that for the heck of it. This is a two-year um, look at this. So this line here, I think between these lines, it's a pretty large amount on, between these lines. <clears throat> so big move to the upside that my portfolio has experienced. And from a two-year uh, look at it, uh, it's up quite a bit. I'll just say that. Uh, housing starts rebound, just to let you guys know. U.S. housing starts rebound in September after sharp drop in prior month. So we do have a rebound in housing starts. Uh, gold approaching $2,000 an ounce again. <clears throat> now poised for a historical breakout that could mark the beginning of another long-term cycle. Ray Dalio put it succinctly. If you don't own gold, you know neither history nor economics. Uh, we've got a third cycle coming up, and we have broken uh, here recently out to the upside. Uh, Ronnie says, got miners. Uh, these are gold and silver miners. You can see no one is bullish on gold and silver miners, and we've got the stochastics starting to potentially come up where we could see an outperformance of gold and silver mining companies. Might be something that you might want to watch. 
Uh, here's gold. Big long-term patterns. It's a nice cup and handle pattern on gold, and we are about to break to the upside. Go gold. More gold break into the upside of the handle here recently, and we're probably going to see a huge move to the upside of gold in the maybe even $3,000 level at some point. Uh, silver sitting right below the huge blue breakout line. It now has a red circle. Um, huge bullish reversal uh, at big support. Mid-month, though, still. But this still is looking very good. Generational breakout should be uh, incoming for silver. Uh, if gold can break out here like we have uh, and it continues higher, I, I'd expect silver to uh, break out and resume its secular bull of the second leg. The first leg was uh, 2000 to 2011, and now we're going to get another leg here, a big one. Uh, Japan fears oil price spike with Middle East turmoil. Uh, Japan's government is growing increasingly concerned about rising oil prices with the double impact of the escalation of Hamas, Israel conflict, and output cuts by major oil producers. Um, this is Graham. I think he, it's a good uh, quote here. Day traders consider themselves successful uh, if they bought a stock at 10 and sold it at 11, bought it back the next week at 24 and sold it at 25, and then bought it a week later at 39 and sold it at 40. If you can't see the flaw in this, that the trader made $3 in a stock that appreciated by 30 bucks, you probably shouldn't read the rest of this book. Howard Marks, the most important thing. Uh, a trader thinks that they are successful doing this. Oh, I made a little profit. Oh, I took my profits. Oh, oh, oh. Guys, just ride this thing. We've got a big bull market that's coming. And that's where, you know, read the book, um, The Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, uh, Jesse Livermore. You know, size up the big trend. That's where the big money's made. It's not this small little money that's made making a dollar here and there. It's the big money that we're going, at least that I'm going for. Big money that I'm going for, um, and I'm riding it. And, again, this is, someone asked me, what are my returns? That's what it is. Boom. I just gap my portfolio, it, and this is... I don't know. This is this is a good chunk higher. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to talk numbers, but it's, it's a lot higher. So what I'm doing is working is what I'm saying. Um, the long-term chart of Venezuelan oil production is the textbook example of resource industry mismanagement. Venezuela's oil production over time, way down, way down here. And this is what's supposed to break, uh, bail us out. I like the chart pattern. It's the, it's the uh, Batman pattern. <laughs> uh, oil freight has surged everywhere since Hamas attacked Israel. The cost of transporting oil had surged on almost every mainstream, mainstream trade uh, route in the week that, that since Hamas has attacked Israel. So big surge there. Uh, again, this is the public debts projected to skyrocket, just ripping higher here. Way, way up for federal debt versus GDP. Uh, it says the U.S. needs to refill its dangerously low oil reserves. The government has let its crude stockpiles fall to levels that leave it exposed to any interruption in global supplies. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna fill it up right when uh, the price is expensive. <laughs> it's great. Um, confirmed on U.S. government bond 10-year uh, yields. Just ripping higher here, up and handle. It's like we could go a lot higher there. Um, and that's where I'm going to end it, guys. That's what I've got for today. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Hopefully, you guys got a lot out of this. And um, we have a 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on Sunday. Question and answer session for those that are members. And uh, I'll catch you guys then. This is Finding Value.